Dearly beloved of the Lord God, praise God and welcome to our sharing. We praise God for every opportunity, for every moment. And so let us pray, giving thanks for this little time that has given us to share together. Father God in heaven, we thank you for every opportunity that you give us to interact with your word, because your word is life. And we pray the Lord you bless our time together with my brethren. And so that we gain more from your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved of God, we appreciate God for every time. Every time, every time, every moment. Because every inch of our life is his doing. Every moment of our life is his making. And we praise him because he's our maker. He is our sustainer. He's our keeper. And so every moment that we dive into his word, we gain insights insights that will be helpful in our life in the moments to come and then reflecting on what has happened before and so that we pick lessons that uh, those that are bad we leave them and something that has been good we carry it on for his glory and so we get into scripture and the scripture has very many things that specifies for us reading it thinking through it and the term we use is meditation, to meditate and energize ourselves with the word. And so we shall continue on with our scriptures, just like I've done in the past, we do it again now, talking about what the Bible talks about people, the people that lived during Bible times. And like I've always mentioned, there are those that did what God wanted and are praised for what they did. And those that did bad, even in the eyes of God, they are also put there, not because of anything else, but for our lessons, for our learning. Everything that is said in the Bible, everything that was, you realize that is. Let me repeat that what was, is. And what is, was. And what was, will be. There's a scripture that says that, and you know that actually what was in the past can be happening now, and what is happening now is expected maybe to repeat itself in the future, and we will have very many examples towards that. And so we have some biblical names that we shall continue talking about. And this time, I bring you, could it be called a rare name, but it's well known in the book of Prophet Daniel. We have talked about Prophet Daniel himself as a personality. We have talked about his colleagues, the three young men that he was with. And then we have talked about events that uncovered themselves during his time. And now we bring the name of one of the kings. There are several kings that I mentioned. One of them is called Prof uh, King Daniel. I mean King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar was one of them. My, my, my mind ran very quickly to Daniel because actually the book that we're talking about. But Nebuchadnezzar was one of the kings. Cyrus was one of the kings, Darius was one of the kings, but let us concentrate this time about King Nebuchadnezzar. He is mentioned as one of the key characters in the book of Daniel. He was a great king and his name meant many, many things. His parents must have given him this name because it was praising their gods and from the root I discovered that actually the name is Nabu. Nabu meaning in their language, protect my heir. Heir is someone after you die who takes over. So Nabu means protect my heir according to the renderings that I have found. And Kudur in their language means boundary or border, but in some cases also meaning heir or firstborn. And so it was about protecting, it was about, you know, Airship, airship, someone taking over after someone has died. And this when Nebuchadnezzar comes, the Hebrew rendering is Nebuchadnezzar, and they are, the way they call it is a complicated pronunciation that I don't want to dive into here. But the thing is, Nebuchadnezzar, the one of the kings, you read about him in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 3, and but the portion of scripture that we're going to use for this particular time that we are together is Daniel chapter 4. It is a scripture. And so we read it. 
um, I just want to read a few verses. He did great, many, many great things, good and bad. But this portion that we're going to read in Daniel chapter 4, uh, verses 29, we shall read about him after getting to a certain level. He over-exalts himself and then something happens. And so let us read it there and then we shall have, we shall share a few thoughts about Nebuchadnezzar that will be relevant to our being because actually every personality that we bring here, every person that we talk about, every name that we talk about is for our lessons. Learn something, pick something, you know, so that like I've always said, and I say it again, that while you still live, you'll be able to leave something that people, people talk about. Are you at work? Are you at home? Are you wherever? And so that actually after your departure, or even while you are still there, people will say, yes, we have people that are called bad map, bad people, but you know, they have names related to that because of what they do. We have people that are called good, 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 good because of what they do. And so what does, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? So that actually, he was eventually taken into what we're going to read. Now, Daniel chapter 4, verse 28, that all this time, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 29 is my interest, and then we go down. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king, ans and the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my, by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. Now, when I mentioned my and emphatic, he is looking at himself in his own power, in his own might, my power, my majesty. And so we take something from there. And then verse 31 while the words were still in the king's mouth, he was speaking, my, 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 my. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall not, you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you. Until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives, gives it to whom he will. Verse 33, immediately. The word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers. And his nails were like bird's claws. And verse 34, that we are going to read 34, 35, and then we shall finish there. The point is very, very clear. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven after seven years in the wild. He remembered something came to him. He lifted his eyes to heaven. So at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High. This time he mentions, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him what have you done now friends you can read on and so well verse 36 let me read at the same time my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom my majesty and splendor returned to me my counselors and my lords so to me, and I was established in my kingdom 
and still more greatness was added to me. And verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. You see, there's something that actually lands there. I extol the king of heaven. Because actually it had, for all of all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now, praise the Lord, brethren, that actually these portions of scripture come to teach us something, to teach you something, teach me something. Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 1, 12, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, you know, his greatness had gone miles. And when you want to think a little bit deeper, he was the king at that time, king of, of Babylon. But he's majorly portrayed negatively in the Bible. But one good thing that actually I discovered about him is when he lifts his eyes to the heaven, when he was in the wild, and we shall pick some lessons from there. Nebuchadnezzar is known to have been a warrior king, greatest military leader in Babylon. He did, because he conquered kingdoms, including you know, these, the, the, the Jews were deported. All of them were taken to Babylon as, um, you call them uh, refugees, you call them exiles. And so they, they were all there. Many, many people were conquered. He saw numerous military successes. He was a military genius, therefore. He did great things in terms of military. He building works can, you know, they are mentioned all over. Nation building initiatives in his kingdom, they were enormous, including the greatest statue that led to um, the punishment of the three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, they actually were thrown into the fire because they had refused to worship one of the greatest statues that are mentioned in the, in the, in the scriptures. And so he was a great, a great person, building works. He had done greatly. It's also known about him that he was powerful and longer serving in Babylon. We have mentioned other kings like Darius, like Cyrus and others, but he is known to have been the longest serving. His life was characterized by dreams, visions. Remember, when you read Daniel, uh, you know, Daniel goes to interpret dreams. So, and some of them were troubling dreams. And one of them that actually that elevated Daniel to the highest uh, position in the kingdom was when he interpreted the dreams of, actually interpret, he told and interpreted the dream, the dream of the king. Now, he, he fought his neighboring nations, great empire, conqueror of nations, very proud king of his victories, possessions, wealth, he was an accomplished man. Now, because of these accomplishments, Nebuchadnezzar was highly proud um, and animalsful because of great, you know, things that he had done. But something happens because of the pride, because of the wealth, because of his famous things. I also remembered when we were in primary schools, we were doing the history of Babylon, and um, I remembered something that they could ask about hanging gardens in Babylon. And actually it came and I said, yes, these are some of the, the great accomplishments, hanging gardens, you can imagine flower gardens hanging, I mean fruits, fruit gardens, hanging gardens. That was the greatest establishment. I saw King Nebuchadnezzar, wonderful in the ancient world. And um, he grew, eventually grew careless. And this is the point. After establishment, after success, growing careless, and his cup was full. I have realized that actually when you overaccomplish, you become careless. There are times when I have also become careless because I think that actually when you go to the pulpit for us preachers and you deliver a message today greatly, and sometimes we, we tend to over exalt ourselves and you know the glory of God does not require that. And so many things after great establishment, you have the money, you have the wealth, you have whatever. Whatever usually, usually the temptation, usually the temptation is becoming careless. And so Nebuchadnezzar teaches us something about his carelessness with the things actually that he said. Like we read chapter four, the verses that we read, they said, my power, my majesty, my. And so the moment we, we remove God from the picture, things go wrong. 
the moment we remove God from the picture, things go bad. And so Nebuchadnezzar became reckless, reckless, and the reason why he was punished for seven years in the wild with wild animals. God requires us to worship him, and he has no competitor. In his dealings, he wants everything to be done and pointing to him because he's the creator of heaven and earth. And he has positioned us wherever and whenever. And he does what he, he wills. And so, King Nebuchadnezzar leaves me a lesson. When I accomplish and I become careless, things don't go well. Things go bad when we become careless. Things go bad when we become, you know, don't care. And you don't mind about what other people say. So Nebuchadnezzar leaves me a lesson. And could he leave you a lesson as well? And now his kingdom was taken out from him because of his pride. But listen, in verses 28, like we read, no, no, uh, verses 34, 28, I think. Yes, where he says that um, the kingdom was eventually reinstated from, to him. It was reinstated. Now, what you need to do, is to remember how far you have fallen, to remember how far you've gone and lift your eyes up to heaven. And so him having been driven away from his people and eating grass like animals, now he encounters God from there. That is in verses 28 to 32, uh, when he actually becomes like a wild animal. We used to see pictures of King Nebuchadnezzar as a wild animal. And they would point, uh, they, the people that God has given wisdom, they would paint uh, how he would look like. And as small children, I used to see them, but these days actually I don't, I don't see, but people would, I mean, they, would, they, they bought pictures of how King Nebuchadnezzar looked like when he was, of course nobody was there, but they could imagine uh, him having the, with the long hair, long clothes, whatever it was, looking like a wild animal. But this was the time which was the biggest encounter with the God of Israel. And in verse 32, 34, um, this is when I, he, at the end of the days, he lifted his eyes to heaven. He says, I lifted my eyes to heaven, my reasoning returned. And friends, I pick a lesson from here that the moment when you are in a dilemma, like Nebuchadnezzar was in a dilemma of sorts, a wild animal, seven years, eating grass. But he says when he lifted his eyes to heaven, looking up, and there's a secret in looking up, when you are whatever you are doing, looking up. And this reminds me about the man Abraham, whatever it was in his time. God made him in his life situation. And at night, the Bible says that God would come and look up. And then he would look up. When he looked up, God gave a message. And so, friends, I leave it with you and with me that actually looking up is something which is great. So whether young or old, whether with or without money, look up. That actually God will give you the reasoning. God will give you the energy. God will give you the whatever it is because it's the creator of heaven and earth. And those of you who believe, those of us who believe this, take a message very, very seriously. Now, one, two, three lessons um, that come out very, very quickly is there is a lesson in Nebuchadnezzar's life. There is a lesson on pride. And of course, I could have talked about pride. they one of the greatest sins that we commit. And which many people don't take seriously is pride. And pride leads to the rest of the sins. The moment a saved person be, develops pride. The moment anybody develops pride, it becomes a monster in his life. And God hates pride. God hates pride. And so this man, Daniel, shows us in his writings that Nebuchadnezzar became proud. And remember, what does the Bible say in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, about pride? And of course, okay, it is something that I thought that I should share. Because... Um, it is the most commonly, you know, not taken serious phenomenon in our life, pride. And so 16, 18 to 19 of Proverbs, 
chapter 16, verse 18. The Bible says, pride, pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. And this one is exactly talking about what Nebuchadnezzar went through here. And verse 19, the Bible says that it's better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil of the proud. It's better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Now, friends, pride goes before a fall. In one of our local languages, Luganda, Tamanala, Gakulemberechigu. Personally, I have ever tested this. When you over pride yourself, Echigu is a fall. And so, friends, this is important. Allow not pride overtake you, whether by your wealth, whether by your victories, in whichever circle. Never permit, never allow pride to overtake you. And it is something that you'll pick from this Daniel. Never allow pride to overtake you. God humbles the proud. And so Daniel chapter 4 verse 37, we read about him there. God humbles the proud. And in James chapter 4, we also read about the same pride that God humbles the proud. Now make a choice, brother. Make a choice, sister. Pride and humility. Choose one. And I have seen great people that are so humble. I've seen great religious people, religious men and women that are so humble, down to earth, and people love them. I desire that God gives me the spirit of humility, not to over-exalt myself because of the pride goes before I fall. God disciplines the proud people. And so, friends, by, by the way, even, even Satan that we talk about, he's called Lucifer in the original languages, and one of the great angels, but because of pride, the Bible talks about him as actually there was a war in heaven because actually he became, this is the pride goes before a fall. And so that is one of the great lessons that I pick and I desire that actually as we read the book of Daniel and as we one day wind it up about the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar here at this point, pride is dangerous. So may God enable us during our time to avoid that. To help him, because of, to help us, because on our side, on our side, we cannot. And then another thing that actually we learn is there is hope if you truly repent. Now I picked a very great lesson from Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says that actually he he gives a testimony that the, and says, "I looked up in verse thirty-four at the end of the days." I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned. Praise the Lord. And may God help us, may God help you to look up so that actually hope, hope, hope. We have talked about hope and we shall always talk about hope that actually there is hope. You may be in a very hopeless situation. You think actually you are a gony case. I want to appeal to anyone who thinks that they are a gony case, not at all before God. God welcomes God that is always another opportunity, another chance. Nebuchadnezzar was in the world seven years, but there was another chance for him. Now, you may be, you know, you may have, might have had a series of challenges, one after another, one after another, but listen to me, God gives another opportunity. So there is hope. If you truly repent and return, Nebuchadnezzar did. And so I leave it as a great lesson for you and for me. And finally, I mentioned something that God used Nebuchadnezzar as his servant to punish Judah. And there are people that actually God can use, there are situations that God can use to bring us to the level. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as the servant of God. <laughs> and you know, he calls him his servant. Read Jeremiah chapter 24, 25, verses 4 to 2, I mean 4 to 12, Jeremiah 25, 4 to 12. Now, God calls him his servant, and God can use any situation, you know, to bring us to level. And the people of Judah, people of Israel, had become so proud also, but God used Nebuchadnezzar as his servant to bring them to the level. So Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that there is God in heaven. Now, we also acknowledge as we wind up that we, there is God in heaven. After the dream interpretation, truly your God is the God of, of God, the Lord of Lords, when we read chapter 4, verse uh, 47. So friends, God is in control. 
Now, who is in control in your life? No one, no thing, no place, no time that can be beyond God's rule and reign. Nothing can be beyond God. No time, no person, no situation, no challenge, no whatever. Everything is at the same level before God. So I leave it with you. I have learned greatly from the, this man who was, and the figure written about in the Bible. Shall we ask God to help us so that we don't go his way? But he leaves us a lesson. Although he was called the servant of the Most High, as we read in Jeremiah, like I've said, but he suffered because of the pride that had trickled in. Now, shall we, shall we pray to God to help us so that nothing deviates us, but we shall remain focused in humility before God. And may God bless you and watch over you as we think about these scriptures in the name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we say, Amen. <music>